So um, I got interested in metaphysical poetry through um, George Herbert and some of his poems being set to music by the British composer Vaughan Williams. Um, in the meantime, I heard from a Baba lover, Bruce Faulkner, that Baba liked uh, John Donne and a particular poem of his. So I thought, well, I might try and do something about the metaphysical poets. So the question is, who were these 17th century English metaphysical poets and why were they so conceited? <laughs> Literary critic and poet Samuel Johnson first coined the term metaphysical poetry in his book, Lives of the Most Eminent English Poets, 1179 to 1781. In the book, Johnson wrote about George Herbert, a group of 17th century British poets that included John Donne, George Herbert, Richard Crashaw, Andrew Marvel, and Henry Vaughan. He noted how the poets shared many common characteristics, especially ones of wit and elaborate style, as well as inventive use of what he called conceits. Metaphysical poetry is not, however, considered a genre of poetry, and it's known for putting a greater emphasis on the spoken rather than lyrical quality of the verse. So what in fact is a metaphysical conceit? As I understand it, it's an expanded sense of metaphor, which sometimes lasts through the entire poem. A metaphysical conceit works to connect the reader's physical perceptions to abstract or beyond physical ideas. In other words, meta, above, beyond, or after physical. Comparing unlikely things such as lovers to a compass or the soul to a drop of dew, while employing pun, paradox, and wit are typical characteristics of this kind of poetry. For example, here is a well-known poem that's been excerpted from John Donne's Devotions Upon Emergent Occasions, Medita Meditation 17. And I will play something here. No man is an island entire of itself. Every man is a piece of the continent, a part of the main. If a clod be washed away by the sea, Europe is the less, as well as if a promontory were, as well as if a manner of thy friends or of thine own were. Any man's death diminishes me, because I am involved in mankind, and therefore never send to know for whom the bell tolls. It tolls for thee. So that is a well-known uh, piece of poetry. It's actually a fragment of a larger poem. So here's a little background. Um, this exploration of metaphysical poetry has a pretty narrow focus on John Donne and George Herbert. John Donne, considered to be the progenitor of the metaphysical style of poetry, lived from 1572 to 1631. George Herbert from 1593 to 1632. It's interesting to note that George Herbert's mother named Magdalene was a patron of the arts and her support included John Donne. When George was just three years old, his father died and John Donne as George's godfather stood in for the deceased parent. Both Donne and Herbert ended up clergymen as well as poets, though Donne certainly did not start out that way. Here's an example of his witty and flirtatious poem called 
the flea, which has pretty obvious connotations. Okay. And this is a dramatization of the flea. And it's, it's actually very well read, much better than I would have read it. So here we go. This flea, and mark in this how little that which thou deniest me is. It sucked me first, and now sucks thee, and in this flea our two bloods mingled be. Thou knowest that this cannot be said a sin, nor shame, nor loss of maidenhead. Yet this enjoys before it woo, and pampered swells with one blood made of two. And this, alas, is more than we would do. Oh, stay! Three lives in one flea spare, where we almost, yea, more than married are. This flea is you and I, and this our marriage bed and marriage temple is. Though parents grudge, and you, we are met, and cloistered in these living walls of jet. Though you make you apt to kill me, let not to that self-murder added be, and sacrilege, three sins in killing three. Oh, cruel and sudden. Hast thou since purple thy nail in blood of innocence? Wherein could this flea guilty be, except in that drop which it sucked from thee? Yet thou triumphst, and sayest that thou finds not thyself nor me the weaker now. Tis true, then learn how false fears be. Just so much honour when thou yields to me will waste, as this flea's death took life from thee. So John Donne had a pretty wild life before he became a clergyman. <laughs> so it's interesting that um, John Donne used the flea as like a metaphor for sex, as a metaphor for their possible connection in a marriage. He used it several different ways, and it was uh, a metaphor that he used throughout that poem. It's interesting that Rumi, many centuries earlier, did a poem called Gnats, Inside the Wind. Gnats, uh, G-N-A-T-S. And in this poem, the gnats are plaintiffs at a court, court hearing. Some gnats come from the grass to speak with Solomon. O oh, Solomon, you are the champion of the oppressed. You give justice to the little guys, and they don't get any littler than us. We are tiny metaphors for frailty. Can you defend us? Solomon says, who has mistreated you? The gnats say, our complaint is against the wind. Well, says Solomon, you have pretty voices, you gnats. But remember, a judge cannot listen to just one side. I must hear both litigants. Oh, of course, agree the gnats. Summon the east wind, calls out Solomon. And the wind arrives almost immediately. What happened to the gnat plaintiffs? gone. <laughs> Such is the way of every seeker who comes to complain at the high court. When the presence of God arrives, where are the seekers? First, there's dying, then union, like gnats inside the wind. So the idea of using a small animal to stand for a big metaphor it's been around for a good long while. So John Donne wrote 19 holy sonnets, often referred to as divine meditations, at different periods of his life. 
The sonnets were first published in 1633, two years after Dunn's death. According to Bruce Faulkner, a favorite of Mirababa's was sonnet number 14, Better My Heart. Batter my heart, three-person God, for you as yet, but knock, breathe, shine, and seek to mend, that I may rise and stand, or throw me, and bend your force to break, blow, burn, and make me new. I, like a suit, usurp town to another do, labor to admit you, but, oh, to no end, reason your viceroy in me, me should defend, but is captive and proves weak or untrue. Yet dearly I love you and would be loved fain, but am betrothed unto your enemy. Divorce me, untie or break that knot again. Take me to you, imprison me, for I accept you and thrall me, never shall be free, nor ever chase, except you ravish me. I uh, asked Bruce how he knew that this was a favorite of Mirababa's, and he said that Tom Riley heard in person that Baba mentioned his affection for this poem. And Bruce felt that that information will show up in Tom's book whenever that comes out. <laughs> so one last John Donne poem, which brings up a topic we'll explore in George Herbert. This is Holy Sonnet number 10 it's a familiar theme that directly addresses death in a very challenging way. Holy Sonnet number 10, Death Be Not Proud. Death, be not proud, though some have called thee mighty and dreadful, for thou art not so. For those whom thou thinkest thou dost overthrow, die not, poor death, nor yet canst thou kill me. From rest and sleep, which but thy pictures be, much pleasure. Then from thee much more must flow, and soonest our best men with thee do go, rest of their bones and souls' delivery. Thou art slave to fate, chance, kings, and desperate men, and dost with poison, war, and sickness dwell. And poppy or charms can make us sleep as well and better than thy stroke. Why swellest thou then? One short sleep past, we wake eternally, and death shall be no more. Death, thou shalt die. Well, the idea of killing death is a recurring theme in some of the metaphysical poetry I've encountered. I found a quote of Mirababa's a couple of years ago, which illustrates that possibility. Baba said, if you want to live, live life in such a way that life itself is completely satisfied and die in such a way that you scare death itself. I'll read it again. If you want to live, Live life in such a way that life itself is completely satisfied and die in such a way that you scare death itself. So the idea of death is also going to come up in a song that I'll feature now from George Herbert. 
um, who live basically the same, almost exact, at the same time as uh, John Dunn. And as we, as I mentioned, he was, John Dunn was George Herbert's godfather. This is from a song cycle by Vaughan Williams, British composer. He calls it the five mystical songs of George Herbert. And this song cycle was composed between 1906 and 1911. This particular song is called The Call. So as you heard in that lyric, such a love that killeth death. And it's something that definitely shows up in the metaphysical poets, um, the topic of death. And after all, people at that time, in the 1600s, they were hardly living past 30 years old. I think John Donne lived to be 40, or, or George Herbert did. Anyway, they weren't living long and they had to do with pandemics just like we are. This also reminds me that there is a spiritual truth which simply states that one must in life die before you die. The only way to escape death is to die before you die. Another song from this song cycle is called Love Bade Me Welcome, another George Herbert poem. In this poem, love is personified in such a way that reminds me of the story of the prodigal son. The idea that we might feel burdened by choices we've made and find it difficult to embrace love, and yet love in the form of Meribaba or Jesus shows up in our life, and we find that we are a welcomed guest. This particular version of the song uh, features a piano accompaniment rather than a full orchestra like we just heard, and at the very end there's a wordless chorus that also ends the song. This is Love Bade Me Welcome. Thank you. 
Okay, um, I, 
I came upon a um, quote from the Sufi master Anaya Khan. Uh, Anaya Khan was, you could say, the pioneer who came to America from the East back in the early 1910s to establish Sufism in this country. And the Sufism that he established eventually became Sufism reoriented that Baba took under his wing. He made an interesting comment about the power of music. He said, what science cannot declare, art can suggest. What art suggests silently, poetry speaks aloud. But what poetry fails to explain in words, music can express. Whoever knows the mystery of vibrations indeed knows all things. So we're gonna end this exploration uh, with one more song from the Vaughn Williams Song Cycle. And then, by the way, George Herbert did not put these songs together as if it was a cycle. That's, that was totally Vaughn Williams' idea. Um, and this last song, which he calls Antiphon, uh, which really is kind of a part of the traditional Western Christian literature, liturgy, sorry. If you watch the recent um, celebrations in India for the 53rd Amartiti, towards the end, there was um, Ted Judson came out with his guitar and a few others and sang the song about uh, walking with the king, Meher Baba, which is a, a beautiful song. Well, George Herbert, in his own way, gave voice to a similar idea back in the 17th century. And let me bring up the words to that.
<laughs> that's an exuberant <laughs> expression. It's um, beautiful. Uh, so that was the music of Ray Fong Williams, a British composer, um, the five mystical songs of George Herbert. We only heard three of those. The other, the other two were connected with Easter. Um, they sure show the clear devotional quality of George Herbert's poetry. And he, along with John Dunn, John Dunn represent, I feel, our human striving to give voice and expression to metaphysical realities and ideas. I see got, I've got a little time, so I got one more poem, also from George Herbert, which is a pretty exemplary of um, the metaphysical conceit that the, these poets employed. This poem is called The Pulley, P-U-L-L-E-Y. And interestingly enough, um, Herbert never uses the, the, a pulley as an idea, as an image in this poem. But he the idea makes a lot of sense, I think, to us as Baba followers, because Baba says he pulls us in and he pushes us away. So this constant give and take, and Herbert picked, you say, plugged into that. In this particular poem, he uses the word rest, R-E-S-T, several different ways. But in the first time, it's, it's actually as one of the treasures that God bestows on humanity. And then he uses it two more times in slightly different ways. So which is another technique that the poets were using. Um, the way a, a pun functions. Anyway, the pulley by George Herbert. When God had first made man, having a glass of blessings standing by, let us, said he, pour on him all we can. Let the world's riches, which dispersed lie, contract into a span. So, strength first made away, then beauty flowed, then wisdom, honor, pleasure, when almost all was out, God made a stay, perceiving that, alone of all his treasure, rest in the bottom lay. If I should, said he, bestow this jewel also on my creature, he would adore my gifts instead of me, and rest in nature, not the God of nature, so both should losers be. Yet let him keep the rest, but keep them with repining restlessness. Let him be rich and weary, that at least, if goodness lead him not, yet weariness may toss him to my breast. There you go, George Herbert, the pulley. That's a good example of you could say a metaphysical conceit, the uh, literary tool that the metaphysical poets employed, and all poets from Shakespeare, I mean, Shakespeare, all the different poets employ that kind of thing. But these particular ones, people in the 17th century took it to an extreme in certain ways, but also they were struggling with the big issues of truth, love, death. God, you know, so I don't know if anyone has a question, but um, that, that would end the topic. <laughs> this has been so lovely, Telly. Um, I love the way you read the poetry. It really helps bring out the meaning very, very well. So you mm. could have read all of it and I would have enjoyed it tremendously. Uh, I couldn't have read the flea. <laughs> and
and made heads or tails of it the way the guy did in the drama. That was so clever. Yeah. I don't think I had ever um, heard that one before. Very, very clever. Yeah, what a seduction. <laughs> yeah, really. I mean, in doing a little research for this, people kept noting that a flea is this primary example of a metaphysical conceit mm -hmm. um, and typical of the wit. And again, John Dunn had a pretty raunchy life, I think, before he turned to become a clergyman. And, and then he gave that all up. Uh, but he had a very broad life. He, he, um, he traveled a lot. He was in the military at one point. He was connected with government. He had a wife and children. And then he became a clergyman and used to give a lot of sermons, sometimes outdoors. And um, so he was well known for his sermons. Um, George Herbert, on the other hand, was a clergyman the whole time. And yeah, I don't think he ever went outside of that profession. Uh, anyway. So John Dunn packed an awful lot into his relatively short life. Yeah, yeah, he did. Yeah, yeah. It was it was George Herbert only lived forty years, and, and Dunn was a longer lived, okay. um, but still. You know, there was a difficult time and they had plague and they had wars, uh, both. Let's see, John Dunn was raised a Catholic at a time when Catholics were persecuted in England uh, and sometimes thrown out or killed. So, I mean, it was a hard time to be a number of things and survive. He did become an Anglican priest, right? so he didn't become a Catholic priest. He, he, he let, kind of renounced that, uh, and that gave him a platform for which to do sermons and things. Yeah, actually, um, when you when we went through "Death Be Not Proud," I I understood it better than I've ever understood it before. This time it just really came through to me. It's a wonderful yeah. poem. Yeah, he um, he really took death to, um, made a challenge out of it, you know? And <laughs> you know, he was in its face. <laughs> <laughs> and then Baba comes along and says, well, if you live your life fully enough, you'll scare death. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just never gave that a second thought. And then the idea that die before you die. Yeah. Mm. I don't know if anyone else had anything to say or um, a question or a comment. Oh, I want to thank Carolyn and Mona and whoever is with Carolyn to, for coming and showing up. <laughs> yeah, that's my um, husband, Chris. Hi, Chris. Um, Hi. <laughs> I was just curious for you, Telly, like these poems, was it Mayor Baba that caused you to become interested in the, the poems of this era and region or what, what drew you to them? Because they, I mean, they're written a long time ago and they're great, but I was just curious what, um, what you know spurred your interest in them good question um well a friend of mine was a professional musician and so he turned me on to the five mystical songs of george herbert so through him i i heard that music for the first time and therefore i heard george herbert's poetry and i hadn't ever thought anything about 17th century english poetry or the metaphysical poets and what they might be about. So that piqued my interest in that era. Um, I remember studying John Donne, but I, in school, but I never really, it never hooked into me until four or five years ago when um, Bruce Faulkner sent around a copy of Better My Heart, 
which is Holy Sonnet number 14 of John Donne. And I realized, and then he said, this was a favorite of Baba's. And I thought, oh, that's something I should pay attention to. And so that was new to me entirely. Um, but it opened my eyes to how these people in the 17th century were, were seekers and they were looking for answers and they were posing questions about life and about death, about the nature of God and what is love and uh, how can I experience love? And they, they seem to be doing a, a very good job coming off the heels of Shakespeare to probe those kinds of things in certain ways as deep as or deeper than what Shakespeare did. I mean, there, there are, I don't know, there, there could be up to a dozen poets that they consider metaphysical poets. I listed maybe five or six. And I only, it's only these two that I ever have had some kind of direct connection with. Uh, yeah. Hmm. Mona, did you have a question or anything? I really enjoyed it. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> um, I, <laughs> the nature of the thing is um, the technical aspect of, of getting these things all together uh, certainly introduced an element of silence <laughs> into the presentation. So Baba was clearly present <laughs> as a linking device between what I was able to put on the, uh, in the presentation. It'd be nice to create a tighter presentation, but it worked pretty well. It worked very well, very impressive. Oh, well, thank you. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say thank you because like I, so like when, like when I go to the center in Myrtle Beach, there's a ton of like Hafez and Rumi and like, so those are the poets that like I associate, like that I read a lot and associate with Baba and that time period. But like, it's cool to kind of like, hear about these other folks that are like in a slightly different part of the world um and and have those connections be made because i just didn't really know a lot about this yeah yeah that um i find it's intriguing um when i go through any poet from any era how they express uh, so many of the same ideas, and yet in a, in their own way. So it's uh, it's accessible. Um, I'm thinking of someone like E.E. E. Cummings or one of the more current poets. In fact, it was T.S. Eliot, among some other 20th century poets, who brought to the public eye the what you could call the importance of the metaphysical poets. They kind of went, went for several centuries without much notice. And um, in John Donne's day, virtually none of his poems were published. And they got shared among people who would copy them out for each other. So it's kind of like what we do when we, uh, the way we connect on internet and Facebook, you know, we share stuff informally. So it was informal sharing of his poetry, but not, not actually published. I'm not sure about George Herbert, but basically those two poets and the other metaphysical poets, just at the end of the 17th century, they kind of just fell off the map and didn't get picked up until in the 20th century. Again, someone, T.S. Eliot and some others. It, their kind of imagery um, resonated for them. And they incorporated some of those kind of metaphysical conceits into their own expression, uh, which is interesting how 
you know, things come around again, even though they're centuries old. And in the same way, I was intrigued that here, John Dunn writes about the flea, this little tiny creature. And then here's Rumi, who writes about gnats several centuries earlier, you know, <laughs> and how they both make use of that image and of that conceit, you could say. Well, I have one other thought too. You know, Baba uh, told us to remember him as best we can. And he would, he said at some point, and you can read about it in um, Darwin Shaw's book, Effort and Grace, to remember Baba in the morning, at noon, at five o'clock, and at the, just before going to bed. And, and he said, um, remember, dress your soul with Meher Baba. I'm dressing my soul with Meher Baba. And actually, to dress your soul is pure metaphysical poetry. It's a metaphysical conceit. You know, who can, who can actually dress a soul if you take it literally? But metaphorically and metaphysically, it makes a lot of sense that you clothe yourself in Meher Baba's name and his presence and you wear him like a cloak. And anyway, it, it's just interesting. Telly, two things that I that you're bringing to mind is that Baba also used an insect talking about mosquitoes. If we think of Baba, then it's like a mosquito net, <laughs> keeping the mosquitoes away. Yeah. And, the, and <laughs> beautiful presentation. I thought it was exquisite. Oh, thank you. Well, it was, it was my pleasure. It was, it was fun to do. It's just uh, trying to get the nerve, the technology to work is a bit nerve wracking. <laughs> But um, anyway, I, I appreciate you all showing up. <laughs> it's been a lovely evening. Thank you so much. You did a wonderful job. Thank you so much, Telly. It was very rich. I don't very loving, very loving. No, I don't see you guys, but thank you for tuning in. <laughs> okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.